So, uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about fuzzing. So, uh, feeding randomized, uh, but not entirely random, uh, input to your application to, uh, to test it, so to make it crash. So, uh, I mean, the, the concept has been for a while, around for a while, and uh, uh, essentially, if you are writing in a, a program in an unsafe language, uh, so C, C++, Fortran, whatever, uh, you, you have all those memory issues, right? You, you read too much, you write uh, to the wrong place, you free the memory and then use the memory and so on. Uh, in principle, the same, uh, the same rules would apply to any, any program in any language. And we could, for example, feed uh, randomized input to our Python program to, to see if it, for example, doesn't fall into an infinite loop, but it will be much less useful because all those uh, uh, bugs that come from lack of safety uh, wouldn't be there and uh, uh, well, programming is much easier in those languages. So, so this talk is about uh, um, fuzzing of essentially C or C++ programs. Um, and if we, if, we, if we work in this area, we have to have a whole set of tools uh, I mean, we, we, we ramp up the diagnostics in the compiler, we tell it to turn on the all possible options, uh, all possible warnings. Um, we run our program under the bar grind. Uh, we do coverity, we do uh, RGTM, it's another static checker that can be hooked up to um, in GitHub, very product. sometimes it provides very nice results and so on. Uh, and then we write tests and we put asserts in our code. And all those things are tools that you, you, you just need to use. And uh, well, if you don't use them, you uh, let some bugs that could be easily caught uh, not be caught and maybe, uh, well, be found by your users. Uh, and uh, so, so fuzzing is yet another tool in this, this whole suit. And it also builds on those other tools because uh, Fuzzing is just the generation of input, so it's not uh, on its own. It doesn't do much. Um, so uh, I think it's a bit surprising if you if you haven't done it. But fuzzing t tends to find different bugs because uh, well, random input is very much different from normal input, and then you just find different different issues. Uh, so. The concept has been around for a long time and people have been doing this for years and years, but there have been two, two developments, two technical developments which uh, made it much more mainstream. So um, first is that uh, we can instrument the code uh, and know exactly which uh, branches in the code are taken and we can take this, this data, so we take a, a, an input sample, we run the code, we look uh, which paths through the code were taken, and then we uh, try to generate uh, a sample that takes different paths. And uh, whenever we hit a different path, we can uh, we know this uh, based on the uh, coverage feedback. So uh, we are not blind; we, we can see where we're actually where, where we're going in the code. And the second thing is that um, people started using um, genetic algorithms to to actually take this feedback data and try to generate inputs which would hit more uh, new places in the code. Um, so, uh, I mean, you, you, can, you can think about this uh, as, a, uh, as a black box optimization problem where uh, you have a, um, well, you, you run some, you, you get generate some input. The, the input space is very large because you have, let's say, a, a a kilobyte of data that any, any bit and any byte can be set to an arbitrary value in there. Um, and then you, 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 run the, you run the program and you get some number that specifies what, what, what the coverage was. And uh, uh, you flip one bit and then the, the coverage goes down and com changes completely. So it's, the, it's an optimization in a very non-linear non space where the um, uh, uh, the fitness uh, function for neighboring points can be completely uh, different. So uh, in this kind of scenario, uh, genetic fitting algorithms are generally the answer and uh, this allows us to uh, find 
bugs in this enormous space of parameters much faster than we would otherwise. Uh, and the kind of a third non-technical non development is that people have made it really easy to use, or relatively easy to use, and it's just nice. Um, so, right, fuzzing is about uh, uh, just generating randomized inputs to your program. Uh, and uh, uh, I said that it's randomized but not random. So I want to underline the fact that if we just took uh, input from dev view random and, and fed it directly to the program, this wouldn't be very useful. So uh, many years ago, uh, uh, 10 years ago or something like that, people started fuzzing system calls. And uh, so let's take uh, uh, mmap, right? And it has uh, like a, a bunch of parameters. And one of those parameters is the, 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 uh, the protocol that specifies how the, how the mapping should be done. And it's an integer, so it has uh, 4 billion possible values. And of those, all, all, the, all of those values only uh, two or three are meaningful, and for any other one, the program will, uh, the, or the function being tested will immediately return a result that it is, the input parameters are invalid, and this is just not interesting. But, uh, so if we feed random data to the, to the function, uh, we will only pass this one parameter, I mean, useful value for this parameter once in every three out of, let's say, four billion times, so we will spend a lot of time doing nothing interesting. Uh, but once we have the feedback coverage, we, we learn that, well, all, without knowing it a priori, we learn that uh, there are a few useful values. And once we hit them, we keep them, and then we uh, build solutions, uh, well, uh, test samples on top of that. So uh, how, how does it work? Uh, we have a. a we have a very simple entry point function that takes a, a blob of data, so, so an array of bytes uh, with some length, uh, and runs the code to be tested. Um, <coughs> this interface is uh, very, very simple. And this is nice because it allows us to completely separate the, uh, the stuff being tested from the whole yeah. testing framework. Because we can, uh, well, we can do this kind of function in, in, in any program for any library being tested. And then, of course, uh, once we, 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 um, we have a fuzzing engine which gives us inputs, it, it, we, we can attach it to any, any of those programs being tested, and it's a very nice split. So, uh, uh, so uh, as part of the, of the uh, code being tested, we, we, we write a function like this. And we, we consume it in two ways. Uh, the more straightforward one is that we uh, just write a simple main function that uh, takes a file, reads the file into memory, and runs this function. So it's just a, just a way to uh, test our code once we have a, a single sample. Uh, so we, we compile this, run it, and then, well, uh, maybe it crashes and maybe it doesn't crash. Uh, if it doesn't crash, then we go back to the beginning. I mean, there isn't, there, we haven't found a bug. But if it crashes, then of course we have something to fix. And uh, uh, this, uh, if we found a crashing input, then of course it's interesting and we, we save it to a file. Um, so uh, before I said that this the, the fuzzing test builds on top of the other tools. So when we compile and run our program, uh, if we just do a straightforward <coughs> compile uh, and, uh, and run it, it won't be very useful because, well, the, the, the problem with memory bugs in C is that you can scribble some memory and your program can crash, for example, a week later, right? It's uh, not, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's not so easy to actually uh, always have an invalid program crash. So we, we compile the program with all the memory uh, sanitizers, leak checkers, and so on, and try to, to make the program f crash as fast as possible if it actually does something wrong. And of course, we turn on all the, uh, the, the, the asserts and the, the bug checks and so on and so on. Uh, so that's, that's one way. Uh, and the other way is that we take the same function, but we, we, don't, we, we link it to a fuzzing engine. Uh, so something that will call the, the, the function over and over with different inputs until it finds a one that actually causes a crash. Um, so 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we, we want to, 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 to apply, well, whatever we can to find the bugs to make the, the program uh, crash as fast as possible. Um, and uh, uh, what kind of bugs do we find? I mean, this is, I think that the, the, the first ones, the, I mean, the ones at the top are pretty obvious, right? I mean, if we, if we write past the end of the buffer uh, and our program is um, uh, compiled with address sanitizer, this will be caught because there's a, uh, a guard inserted and so on. Uh, uh, invalid freeze, uh, unaligned access, and so on. And then hopefully we can also find more subtle bugs like buffer overreads and uh, use after free. Um, but also memory leaks and uh, what I, what it wasn't, what at least for me it wasn't obvious is that, uh, and I wasn't expecting this, is that fuzzing tends to find um, either hangs or very slow runtimes in different parts of the program. So, for example, in systemd we had this case where uh, um, a config file was being parsed, and uh, the uh, location of the of the starts of the different headers in the, the sections, section headers in the file, were put in a list. Now. I mean, this code were completely fine. There was nothing wrong with it. But once you had a thousand uh, sections, uh, the access to this list became quadratic. And if you had a, a million, it was, it was essentially an infinite loop. Uh, and a human would never write a config file with a thousand section headers, most likely. I mean, very unlikely. But um, this is exactly the kind of thing that uh, randomized input gives you. And uh, it's not so unlikely to happen because, for example, we do uh, um, automatic configuration with Ansible and maybe somebody writes the, the generator in a way that actually creates a file like this. And uh, the, um, I mean, pe occasionally people would have a config file with a hundred section headers and the, and the program would run, uh, well, a bit slower, but not enough for somebody to notice. But using fuzzing, we, we kind of nicely discover this. Um, uh, right, and uh, so th there's a few different ways in which the coverage uh, feedback can be done, and the, uh, the one, I, I mean, I'm going to be talking about Leap Fuzzer, and uh, it uses a, a, a sanitizer plugin to, to, to annotate the code. Um, so uh, there's two, um, Two ways that we uh, that that we can run. I mean, once we have the um, our entry point function, we can either run it uh, as a single program invocation and then generate a new set of data and start the program again and again and again. Uh, and this this works okay and it is very I mean it's the most general, but it takes it has the, the overhead of starting the program over and over, uh, and uh, uh, a well, a slightly better way to do is to do it is to do it in process. So, uh, but for this to be to be meaningful, the, we need to have no uh, state left, right? We need to have a um, uh, well, no threads, no global variables, no, nothing that I mean. We, we call the function once, and then we call it again, and we want to start from from uh, a clean slate, and. Uh, I wrote that well, 100 milliseconds is, is not bad, but we probably want to do a th thousands of samples per second. So uh, I think we, we want to go be below a millisecond for a single round. Um, and there's a number of uh, fuzzing engines, so, so, so engines which generate uh, uh, our inputs. Uh, Leapfuzzer and AFL are the, most, uh, are the two most popular ones. Um, they they both do uh, coverage uh, guided um, input generation using genetic algorithms. Uh, there is also Hong Fast, which is a new thing. Uh, I think it, it, it is kind of the same idea. All three have the same, same ideas and provide the same functionality, just in slightly different implementations. Uh, there is another one. There is uh, Radamsa. It's a, a tool that outgrew out of a protocol testing, network protocol testing um, project, and it tries to 
uh, it doesn't use coverage feedback. It just tries, tries to analyze your input sample uh, using some uh, syntax analysis and then generate another one that is uh, uh, similar syntax but, uh, uh, well, mutated. And um, it, it generates surprisingly interesting input samples. Uh, Okay, uh, so, so we have that and we, now we need to, uh, well, we, we actually need to do the fuzzing, so, so we need to, 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 to apply CPU power to this. And uh, there's a very nice project that uh, provides this. It's a um, Google-funded thing that grew out of Chromium testing. Uh, so essentially is the, the idea is that you have an open source project, you hook it up with OSS fuzz, you provide a number of uh, fuzzers and they will run the fuzzers for you. Uh, so they, 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 a number of fuzzers, a number of configured uh, sanitizers, uh, and they, they run it on a cluster, uh, report bugs uh, with kind of like responsible disclosure, so they, they, they are uh, um, only accessible to project members initially, and then after uh, they are either fixed or sometime they are opened up to the public, and uh, it kind of works automatically nice in this way that they will, they will clone uh, your repo and uh, if a fix is pushed to the repo, they will close the bugs automatically and so on. Uh, so, uh, so in the project we have to have the fuzzers and a, and a way to build them, I mean essentially a build target. And uh, in the, on the OSS fuzz side, side uh, we, we uh, define a Docker file to, to prepare the build environment and build, the, build our program, a script to build it, uh, and if we have the target, it does the script essentially called the build target uh, and some, some small metadata. Uh, uh, so let's, let's do an example. Uh, I mean, I, it's, I said it's, a, it's in KA sync, but it's, I mean, this, this part is actually pretty generic. So, um, the entry point function was called do it in my previous slide. Now it's called LLNV fuzzer test one input. But essentially it's the same thing, right? It takes a blob of data with some size and does whatever the code needs to do and returns zero if everything is okay. Uh, so uh, a practical consideration is that, uh, well, in this case I want to take, uh, test a compression function. So it, the function takes two uh, parameters, uh, a, a blob of data and a compression um, uh, algorithm uh, uh, specified as, a, as, a, as, a, as an integer. And uh, I, want to, I want to have both of those things uh, in my single blob of data that is uh, given from the, from the fuzzing engine. And I, somehow I need to encode those two things. So uh, I uh, Put a, I treat the, the input data as a header uh, and then use the first byte as the algorithm and the, uh, the data as the remaining data, but also I put a, a few uh, 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 bytes of reserved space. So, so the, the idea is that as the program, uh, as the fuzzing uh, pro progresses and we find um, uh, crashers, we save them to files, but as we try, in the future we, we might need to add more parameters and then we want to um, keep the data stable. So, so this is a way to, to, to have the, the input samples preserved uh, and usable in the future as we, even as we add more parameters and mutate our, um, uh, well, this, this function, I mean the, this part here. So, uh, um, uh, right. Uh, um, oh, I wanted to add that uh, if we, if if we um, if we are running under a fuzzing engine, we don't want to output any logs or anything like that. We want to run as fast as possible. So uh, there is this. Uh, I mean, something like this is is there to make it possible to turn on the debug logging when, when because it is useful when you are actually debugging a crash. But otherwise, you want it to be completely disabled. Uh, and uh, so the actual testing, uh, we, we get the data, we split it up, and then essentially the interesting part is that we call a decode function 
uh, on the on the buffer, and uh, either it crashes or it doesn't crash. Uh, uh, okay, so this is well, this is this is the actual testing part, right? Um, so uh, I said that there is also a Docker file. Uh, and this is the ugly part because building uh, each iteration of the code uh, takes, uh, I mean, you, I don't know if, if why it likes to download so much stuff, but it's like a fun, fun megabyte per iteration. Uh, uh, um, but, you know, it's all, it's all relatively simple stuff. I mean, you, you, you uh, Copy it from a different project, adjust it a bit, and then and it's, you're done. Uh, so, so how, how how does it work? Uh, we have a uh, we have a helper for to, to call Docker for, for us. Uh, build build an, build image, build the fuzzers, uh, and then run the fuzzer and uh, wait for it to crash. Uh, so. So this is the, the, this part installs the all these dependencies were specified. This part actually essentially calls our build target to build the fuzzers, and um, well, and then this runs the binary. Um, so this is an example output. Uh, it well, it's uh, uh, it is running with. Um, Leak fuzzer and is using the address sanitizer, uh, and uh, there's some limit on memory and the maximum time for it to run and so on, and it just feeds samples. Well, uh, it, on this screen it gets to up to two million samples, right? Uh, so it's pretty boring, uh, but at some point it crashes, uh, and uh, this is in white and black. But the nice thing is that if we if it, this is actually pretty colorful output from um, uh, address sanitizer uh, that includes uh, uh, information about the uh, wh wh what was the bad memory access that we did, uh, and so on. And we, we have the trace back. Uh, and uh, the important part is here at the end that we get a file. All right. So so this is the file that. Uh, it, now, if we run our standalone fuzzer on the, with this file, uh, we we get a crash and we can start with I don't know GDB or whatever or bargain and actually find out what the what the problem was. Uh, and um, I don't know. It's, I uh, I put some links in the slides uh, for to more documentation. Uh, and uh, I know I'm out of time. Yes. yes. So I have direct time for questions. Uh, just to work clear. Please go ahead. Two or three. So how many bugs did you find in the Um, 20, 30. Uh, so, uh, right, I, I, I wanted to say this, that uh, if you look at the advertisement page of any of those projects, like in Fuzzer and, and um, AFL and so on, they have a long list of projects which they, which they fuzz. And for pretty much every of those projects, they have a list of bugs. And uh, another thing is that uh, uh, if you if you start fuzzing, um, uh, you immediately pre pretty quickly find a few easy bugs, and then it quickly falls off. So if you don't fuzz, you make it very easy for somebody who is uh, who wants to find a bug, a hole in your project, to 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 do this some simple, simple fuzzing and easily find an issue. If you take the preventive step of doing it yourself, you actually make it much harder because then you don't need to fast for 50 milliseconds. You need to fast for five days, and that's a completely different problem. Then, uh, more questions? Okay. So thank you.